my programmer died, and then I was like, screw it, I'm gonna try something different. So now I switched to AVR, and um, in some ways it's, uh, the development is better because when you buy this board, it comes with switches, it comes with LEDs, it comes with a lot of useful stuff that you can just use right out of the box. You don't have to like, build your own circuit. The, the one I was using before was strictly just a programmer and it wasn't so much of a prototyping environment. <clears throat> this is just a screenshot of uh, their IDE. Everything, uh, at least for the, the simple stuff, I just use assembly for the chip. There are uh, C compilers. I have never used them. And here's a, a pretty picture of the board, which is a, the same board I have up here. A logic analyzer. Logic analyzers will make your life so much easier. It, it'll be able to uh, synchronize all these different signals at the same time. You want to establish some kind of relationship. Oh, this, this goes up, the chip enable goes up, then you get this data coming out. You have to establish these kinds of relationships to be able to properly debug and reverse engineer. Better, better um, logic analyzers are going to do some type of analysis on the data. You'll be able to uh, set a type of interpreter on the data. So display it as hex. Say this is a, an address, so you can group together, um, let's say, 16 different uh, clips that, that are on your, on your uh, address bus. And you'll be able to see what addresses are going across the wire, and it's going to um, provide you the number. You can also look at the, the data that's going across. And uh, even better than that, you can uh, have interpreters for, for these types of things here on the left-hand side. We'll, we'll go over some of these a little bit more, but uh, like look at the bottom. We have a, <clears throat> it'll decode RS-232 for us. That's, that's great. We see the, the commands coming across. We don't have to like look at bits anymore. And that's how it should be. I mean, we, we don't want to waste time doing that stuff if it can do it for us. And here, here, here is just connected to one, one single connector is hooked up there, and that was at the, the transmit data. And it can also be broken out into a table like this, where you have, uh, when, the tr when the event was triggered, what values are coming across that. And uh, if you look at the RS-232, I mean, we see line feeds there. We see commands. That's pretty cool. This is a really cool, uh, cool board. This is, is a microchip, uh, um, a PIC, but it, um, it's hooked up to USB. It, it already has a USB controller on it. It comes with firmware, and it acts as a, a serial port. So you connect to it, and you can uh, turn on certain pins to be output or input. You can send data across it. So let's say you, you develop something on, uh, on one of your boards that's going to take care of the, the low-level single binging, right? Then you want to control it from your computer. So you just hook this up and set the appropriate uh, output pins, connect it to your other device, and it's all controlled from your computer now. <clears throat> the, the schematics are available. The full source code to the firmware is available. There's various kits. This one specifically... Um, here I bought from uh, SparkFun. Uh, that place is great for uh, doing prototyping, especially things like this that are like halfway there, that you don't have to do that much work. They have really good tutorials on um, doing surface mount soldering, uh, beginning uh, embedded programming for these types of chips. It's uh, really like a hobbyist kind of store. They also, uh, which is kind of cool, is they took apart that... Um, the Nike iPod thing that goes in your shoe and keeps track of you running and stuff. They, they broke the, all that out, uh, reverse engineered it, show you what transmitter chips they use, and it's surprisingly similar to some of these presenters. Some of them, it, I think it uses one of the same chips as, uh, I believe, the, the Logitech one. <clears throat> so here's some pros and cons of this. Um, it's, the pros is that it's, uh, it's cheap. The thing's only $25, and it just works. Um, it has a large number of I.O. ports. You can set some of them to digital or analog. And um, the firmware is well maintained. It's updated. There's full source to it. But the cons are is its limited speed. Because it's operating as a serial port, it's not operating at the full 
USB 2.0 spec where you can transmit tons of data. This is transmitting at 9600 baud. So you're not going to be able to move huge chunks of uh, data at any decent speed. <clears throat> and using the default firmware, you have no direct driver access. So the only way to use it is to uh, connect to the, to the serial port. <clears throat> so for high speed applications, you're going to have to write your custom, you're going to have to write a custom firmware. And um, right now there is no uh, public high speed firmware for these devices. A couple of people have wrote them, but I think they're keeping on them internally for like their company or what have you. So you'd have to write one yourself. So intra device communication. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a uh, very popular two-wire communication protocol, uh, I2C. squared It's used uh, a lot for uh, the serial EEPROMs. There's going to be a clock uh, signal, a clock line, and then a data line. There's going to be master and slave nodes. There's uh, addressing built into it. Uh, these are the types of speeds that you can expect through it, and you can connect tons of these together. 112 nodes are possible. <clears throat> and this is a more recent design. Um, it, it went up to 10-bit address space and a lot uh, faster traffic can go through it. Common uses are in these where you'll see them in certain types of devices. You might see them in uh, NVRAM chips. Some DACs might have them. Um, super popular for serial EEPROMs and microcontrollers. You, the way that you can sniff uh, this bus, you could do it manually with your oscilloscope, which is kind of a pain. Uh, you can use a custom microcontroller chip. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but this website, uh, someone wrote uh, some code so it sniffs the bus and then it sends out serial data decoded and then you can hook something else up to it. And then of course there's logic analyzer, which is the, if you have the money, that's the best choice. <clears throat> the, the other popular um, protocol, kind of serial protocol between these types of devices is SPI. And um, if some people have done uh, JTAG, it kind of looks familiar. And that's because it's kind of, JTAG is kind of an application stack for, for uh, SPI. <clears throat> but uh, embedded systems from 8-bit uh, AVR or Atmel devices, little devices, all the way up to ARM uh, system on chips will use this, this bus protocol. Uh, F, uh, FPGAs will use this internally because it, doesn't use a lot of lines, and between your, uh, inside of your FPGA chip, you'll be using this to communicate between different parts. <clears throat> and of course, Flash and uh, EEPROMs use this as well. So you could sniff this with an oscilloscope, but you're going to need at least uh, four channels, three or four channels, depending on the implementation. Most scopes are just two channel. You could uh, write your own code to uh, sniff it with a microcontroller, or you could use a logic analyzer. And this is uh, something that I've been starting to work on, is uh, hardware-level fuzzing. I'm able to inject into these chips. So there's probably some software problems in them as well. The software problems exist throughout um, programming. So if I'm able to inject into the, the chip, let's say into the transmitter, that's giving me direct access as, as a socket to the server, which would be the receiver chip. <clears throat> so um, your, your chip is at the low level. It's flipping bits on and off. So you just can set patterns to send uh, out to that. And because these uh, serial numbers and these command codes are so small, we're talking like 8-bit um, um, data spaces. That's only 256 combinations. You can fly through that, and, and that doesn't take that long. And then you can try to do... Uh, send longer data than expects, and you know, classic, classic fuzzing kind of stuff. And um, <clears throat> just like you have the same constructs, you also have the same problems as software fuzzing. <clears throat> Here's another logic analyzer. This is kind of like your father's logic analyzer. No one has these anymore. So hardware fuzzing, detecting bugs can be difficult. These chips are, are black boxes. You're, you're not going to be able to get inside of them. I can't hook up a, a debugger inside of it and see if there's an exception and, uh, oh, cool, I have a bug. Um, so you really have to try to correlate your data generation and your um, uh, inputs and outputs to this chip to try to determine if anything went wrong. So in the example uh, with a wireless presenter, 
when I was trying to fuzz it, what I would do is I only care about if it gets past the, uh, the USB chip. So I'm going to have something that hooks into the USB stack, and if I see anything coming from that USB ID, I know something got through that, that it shouldn't. So that's, that's one way to check. Obviously, that's at a higher level. There might be uh, deadlocks and other problems at the, uh, the lower level, but when I sent all the data, it, it kept working. Uh, I didn't find any bugs in, in this implementation. Here's something else that is really interesting in uh, embedded systems, and specifically AVR chips. Other chips are vulnerable as well. But there are recursion attacks. And it depends on how the memory is mapped and, and the layout where everything is located in memory. So the problem is, is just like DOS, you have output ports mapped into RAM, and they're mapped into the lower parts of RAM. The stack starts at the top of RAM. <clears throat> and let's say you, you enter a function, and it's doing recursion, and you keep going, you keep going. And boom, you just hit your out ports. Those are the actual pins coming off the chip. So you might cause, um, um, depending on your point of view, worst case, best case, you could uh, possibly maybe cause a fire. I don't know. I thought about demoing that, but then I was like, huh, Black Hat might not like that if I start a fire inside of the side Caesar's Palace. But um, let's say it controls some kind of lock system, and you change the outports to uh, pop the lock because you found some kind of logic or parsing bug in some function that is causing it to uh, lets you keep recursing through whatever input you have. So this is a little contrived. Um, I don't have a, a valid um, in the wild test case or what have you, but the attack is valid. Um, if you can control recursion through some type of logic bug or, or some type of uh, parsing error where it keeps on trying to parse something because the parser is written wrong, um, there are embedded uh, web servers for a lot of these types of devices, so you might have classic classic bugs um, that we see in, in normal computers. And then you can try to change the, the, out, the output with a return address. <clears throat> and um, just like Barnaby's talk, um, there's also a, a vector table at, um, located at the bottom. There's a vector table mapped from, uh, the, from zero on these devices as well. And all these assumptions that we made for general purpose OSs are not necessarily applicable to embedded. So <clears throat> these kind of things you have to kind of look out for, and um, it opens up a, a bunch of different attack vectors. And uh, this right here is, uh, if you start traveling with tons of electronics gear like this and wires and cables and uh, oscilloscopes and stuff, you're going to come across one of these little notices in your bag. <clears throat> it's a notification of inspection. I guess when I was leaving San Francisco at one point with all this stuff, they, they wanted to make sure that I wasn't carrying a bomb in my bag because they saw all this electronic gear. So that's just, you know, in case you travel with this stuff, that might happen to you. So now um, I'm going to do a demo uh, with uh, Joe. You want to come up here? So on Joe's computer, uh, he's, he's going to be running a presentation. We have, uh, he has uh, the, the presenter that goes with the dongle. It's all taken apart, obviously, because I take all these apart and I try to sniff them and whatever. And he has the, the, dongle, the, the presenter that matches up to that dongle and will show that that will click through the slides. And then <laughs> give a hand to my lovely assistant. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, closer to me, I have uh, a presenter that's been taken apart. Uh, it's hooked 